Good evening. Pastor Gordon, I think you mentioned that song on Sunday in your message. Count your blessings. We're going to sing it later. Okay. <coughs> Catch my breath. Good evening. I know Pastor Gordon is talking on a subject maybe that we won't touch on too much in these songs. But all last week, <clears throat> it was Thanksgiving weekend. It was great. And all last week, I have a little book that somebody gave me, a friend gave me, and it had a lot of different things in there about Thanksgiving and thanking God and praising him continually being grateful. How many of you are grateful tonight for what God has done? It takes a minute to read. Do you mind if I do? I'll do it anyway. <laughs> Continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Colossians 2, 6. Many people tend to focus on the negative things that are around them, the flaws and all the things, and fail to see the wonders of God and his grace. God knows every detail of your life from the cradle to the grave. In his eternal design, he plans what is best for you. Sometimes things go wrong, but God can change our situation so that light radiates from the darkness and hope is born from despair. If you feel dejected, Think back on all the good things that have happened in your life, how God has been with you. Thank the Lord for his blessings, and he will bring healing and joy to your life because God is the giver of all that is good. We praise and thank you, Lord, with our hearts and our mouths and our hands for all the wonders that you have done. Amen. Stand, please. We're going to sing some songs about praise and thanksgiving to God and his many blessings to us for so long. Amen. <clears throat> To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Oh, Perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believed that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. the Lord, let the people rejoice, oh come to the Father, through Jesus, 
This old chorus, praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the new time, praise him, praise him, we'll praise him when the sun goes down, praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning. Praise him when the sun goes down. Sing, love him, love him, love him. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime. Love him, love him. We'll love him till the sun goes down. Praise him.
may be seated. That's good singing. When upon thy sparrows you were tempest tossed. Count your many blessings in the moon, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings in him one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. Count your many blessings, every dog will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. So amid the conflict great or so, do not be discouraged, God is, is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend, help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. numbers yet? Hmm? Come on, God's been good. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And after this, we're going to sing a, a little song. It's called The Goodness of God. A couple of weeks ago, they sang it in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning here, and I know probably most of you have heard it somewhere along the way. It's not difficult, but it, the chorus part of it says, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of God. It's a good song. But let's start with Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is so They fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, a hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and spring. And harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses 
sing one more little chorus. Somebody told me earlier today that if God's people are all together worshiping the same Lord, they're going to be in unity, aren't they? They're going to be in unity. Here's a chorus. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with chorus. That cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. That's a prayer. <laughs> Bind us together. Because, you know, we have an enemy that wants to tear us apart. How many know we have an enemy that wants to tear us apart? Wants to bring division. Wants to sow discord. You know, Proverbs talks about seven things that the Lord hates. And one of them is what? Discord. Because it wrecks havoc to his body, to his church. So what a great prayer. Thank you, Dan and the team leading us. Yes. 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 Bind us together. And we have some new camera operators back there. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> and we're always thankful for the team that serves in the back there. You know, we got Gary back there, and we, and we got Debbie, and we got Don, and then, of course, Marlene back here. So all of you are so thankful for your service to the Lord. Amen. Well, there's a hymn sing that's happening this Sunday night at 6 p.m. at the Nazarene Church. And they're getting desperate for musicians. They've asked me to come and play at it. <laughs> so that is this Sunday, October the 17th at 6 p.m. at the Nazarene Church on Highway 33. So come and sing your favorite hymns. Special music by local, no, locale, local. <laughs> local musicians, and a free will offering is taken for charities. All right. Well, we, um, we have a, a, a testimony, so my wife's got to go take that mic down to Bob. He's, I saw him back right there in the, right there, right. okay. We've been praying for Bob's daughter, in case you don't know, and Bob's got a good update for us. Good, now we can get you right on camera. That's wonderful. Why not? 
And why not? That's right. Good evening, everyone. On the last Thursday of September, my wife was talking to my youngest daughter who lives in Alberta, and she was complaining of a sore throat and uh, wasn't feeling very good. And the next day she went to get a COVID test, which turned out to be negative. But on Sunday morning, we received a call that she was so serious that instead of taking her to the Edmonton Hospital, which is closest to her, there was no room. So they had to medevac her via helicopter to, Cal to Calgary. Immediately, she was placed into the most serious uh, location in the hospital and uh, placed on life support immediately and uh, put into a, an induced coma. Uh, so she had her toes hanging over the precipice of death. The, about two days later, we had a FaceTime that the hospital provides. And it's not a pretty sight to see your daughter with tubes coming everywhere, uh, not breathing on her own. She is a severe asthmatic and uh, with a ventilator pumping her lungs. So we, uh, there couldn't have been better courses tonight. And of course, when you're placed in a position like that, uh, you're the old one, that's your child. And I must say that she has four kids. Uh, her husband has kind of not been living with her for the last six years, but still they are in contact all the time. He's a bully, literally. And that's one of the reasons why they went apart. And because of his influence, uh, as a non-vaxxer, her whole family felt threatened and didn't get the vaccinations. And so, as she lay there, we saw her two days after the first sight. The second one wasn't any better. Uh, people get puffy faces and they can just struggling to breathe. And the nurse said, she hears you. And there was a little bit of a smirk of smile that mm. it was her dad. She calls me daddy even now. And uh, so this went on for several, several days. And on September, uh, October the 6th, she was brought slowly out of the coma and uh, the nurse did FaceTime with her at that time. She was smiling, but very, very weak and uh, tired, just like COVID can do to some people. And, but immediately on the Sunday when she went in, I got on my media and had people in India Africa, all around Canada, praying for Tracy. And he is faithful. Yeah. We've been singing that all night. And so as she gained a little bit of strength, she wanted to go back to the hospital nearest the little town she lives in, which is, oh, now I'm going to forget the name, Stettler. And they were going to put her into Edmonton if there was room. There wasn't any room the first time. And so we prayed, let her go back to the hospital that her, is closest to her home and to her youngest son. Yesterday, we were picking apples and uh, Tracy phoned. She was so excited <laughs> that uh, she was being transferred to Stettler and that today she would be able to uh, see her son. Yesterday she saw her daughter who's a student in uh, Lethbridge. And so talking to her yesterday was just 
a delight. Yeah, she's still tired, uh, she's still weak, but she's rejoicing because we know 80% of people who go into ICU, they don't come out with COVID, 80%. So that's the thing I claimed and we all claimed is the faithfulness of Christ. The faithfulness to us that we've seen over the years, wherever we've been, and so I just want to tell you that uh, the vaccines are there. Don't put them off. Get them. It's terrible to see a loved one just dying before, before your eyes. It's not nice. So, miracles still happen today. Amen. 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 So, for those of you who knew about this and were praying, thank you very much. And I have to go now on to... Uh, texting and go all around the world and thank all of the people who have been <laughs> praying for her. But that's a joy to do that. I know she shouldn't be in the hospital for too many more days. She learned something yesterday. She says, you know, Dad, they told me I was in a coma for 11 days. I didn't know it. So God is good. He's he faithful. is good. Amen. Thank you. Wow. God is so faithful. Good testimony, thank you for sharing that. And we continue to pray for your daughter. And um, we want to also remember Alden's family, his sister, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, passed away from Saskatoon. And so they're gonna be heading out there uh, for the, the service. So we want to lift up the Schultz family in prayer. And uh, we also got a message today, uh, some people that were in our church in Dawson Creek two elderly ladies, one is actually in her 90s. Uh, they're both in the hospital and not doing well. So we just thought, we got a bunch of prayer warriors here that we could unite together in prayer, amen? amen. Do you believe God still answers prayer? Amen. How can you not believe it? You just heard testimonies, right? He still answers prayer. So Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. We are so thankful for the power there is in prayer. And there's no distance, Lord, even as we've heard uh, Bob's testimony tonight, and we continue to uphold his daughter in prayer. We're praying for a full recovery, Lord. God, give her a full recovery, full strength, uh, Lord, that everything will come back, Lord, and she'll be just in great health. And we give you the praise for that, Lord. We also just think of the Schultz family tonight as they grieve the loss of a loved one. Just surround this family tonight, Lord. Thank you for the hope that they have, that she's with you today. Oh, Lord, we rejoice with that knowledge that she's with you today. But, Lord, there's a hole that, that is in our lives. And so we just pray, Lord, for your peace and comfort to surround, Lord, the Schultz family, Lord. And we pray for all the relatives, Lord. Just be with them. May your name be honored and glorified. And, Lord, I want to especially also pray for Lorraine and Grace, Lord, in Dawson Creek, Lord, who are in the hospital and lord they need a miracle and lord you are a god of miracles so we pray for a miracle tonight lord you will touch these faithful ladies lord and you will show yourself strong on their behalf you will raise them up we pray according to your will god you would raise them up in the name of jesus and lord all of us here have loved ones we have maybe things in our own bodies that are just not the uh, way it should be. We want to just pray tonight, Lord, for your touch in our own bodies and in those that we care about, Lord. Those who are on our minds right now, we pray for them as well, Lord. God, that you will show yourself strong on their behalf and on our behalf, Lord. Touch us, we pray, Lord, and we thank you for that. So bless your word now. We pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Well, I don't know if you were able to make it on Sunday or not um, to Evangel or caught it online, but I shared a story about my grandfather uh, who got saved during First World War and uh, went on to serve Jesus. But one of the things I didn't share, because uh, I knew I was you know, under a time crunch, is that his name was John, John Green. And he never was a pastor, but they called him a preacher. Because what he did was, you know, he was a logger and they would have the bus that would go out into the bush. As soon as the last passenger got on board, 
Uh, my grandfather would get to the front of the bus and he had a captive audience. <laughs> and so he would just preach up a storm as they were going out into the woods. And he did this for years, and so he got the nickname Preacher John. So you know, I'm so thankful for my legacy and um, so wonderful. And God is faithful. He's faithful to us. He's faithful to you, right? Well, tonight we're going to look at, we're continuing with our study of Philippians, and we're into chapter 1, the last part of that chapter, verse 27, and then we're going to skip the, how many know when the Bible was originally written in, in the books, there were no chapters, we have put them in there for our convenience, so we're going to ignore the chapter break and go right into chapter 2. But tonight, my, if I was to give it as a title, I would say Living, li living Worthy Lives. Living worthy lives. Don't you think we should live worthy lives? He's done so much for us. How can we not do our best and give our best for Jesus? So beginning at verse 27, I'm reading out of the New International Version. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. Bind us together. Wow. A contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. I got a kick when I was reading that verse a couple times tonight or earlier today. It's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer, to suffer for him. You have been given a privilege. Did you know that? You have been given an honor, not only to believe in him, but to suffer on his behalf. It's hard to smile on that one, but it's true, right? Since you are going through the same struggles you saw I had and now hear that I still have. At verse 1 of chapter 2, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Wow. It has been said, you know, that we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we have a fifth gospel, and that is you and me. Christians look to Matthew, Luke, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, but the world looks to you. It's so often people get turned off by church, not because of reading the four gospels, but because of the fifth gospel. Isn't that right? You and I probably all know people here who are turned off from the church. In fact, I was just talking to somebody recently. I don't know if it was here or somewhere else, but I was just talking to somebody recently who, talked, who told me that uh, th this person was turned off of the church uh, because of, of somebody. I don't know who. I, I don't know the whole story, but just that they've been turned off. And I thought, wow. There's someone that was a, bo a poor, poor communicator, a poor example. I, my goal and my prayer is always, Lord, help me to reflect you well. Yes. Isn't that your goal? May we reflect Jesus well because the world is looking to us. We are that fifth gospel. And so a major theme of this book is living the Christian life because we are that fifth gospel. So our lives need to line up with the Word of God, and our text says a lot about the Christian life. So in verse 27 here of our text, Paul says, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now I'm going to share with you uh, in some ways 
some of the ways that we can conduct ourselves in a worthy way. And the word conduct here means the way you live. Uh, the King James Version actually translates the word communicate or, or conversation, which is interesting. Your conversation will give evidence to the real you. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. As believers in, in Jesus Christ, we must work every day on our conduct. And if you've got a wife, she can help you. Amen? Here are some areas Paul mentions concerning our conduct. Number one, he says, walk worthy of the gospel. Now, Paul seems to like this word worthy. Have you noticed that when you read his letters? He seems to like this word worthy. Uh, you know, worthy means appropriately, suitably. So Paul uses this word at least four times in his letters. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And of course, in our text tonight, Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Over in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Wow. What a, what a good goal for us to have, huh? To live a life worthy. Remember that song, Let Me Be Worthy? I can't remember how it goes, all of it. Now, Dan, you must know it. Let me be worthy of the, because of the price you paid for me. Let me be worthy. Jesus made a statement once that those who are forgiven little love little. You remember that? And those who are forgiven much love much. And, of course, he was talking about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery there, and, and uh, you know, she was washing Jesus' feet. And anyway, you know that story. Paul himself knew he'd been forgiven a lot. I mean, he calls himself the chief of sinners. That's quite a statement. So Paul's salvation came in a very powerful way, and his life was totally transformed. And he was so thankful uh, to Jesus for the life he had. And so he always wanted to walk. Paul's goal, his desire was always to live a life worthy of the gospel, worthy of of his salvation. And I know we, we don't work our, for our salvation, we don't earn our salvation, but there is a, a, a walking, being, being worthy of what he's done for us, that we live such an upright life. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus taught us, you know, about, uh, you know, that we need to live this life that's worthy. So each day, walking in his grace uh, towards others, because he's done so much for us, we just got to, we got to be good examples of his grace. Uh, so, so the first thing then is to, uh, to walk worthy of the gospel. That should be our desire every day. Lord, let me be worthy. Let me be worthy today. And then the second thing is to stand firm in one spirit. Just before Jesus went to the cross, he made this, this statement to his disciples, and you all know this statement. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if what? If you have love, one for another. One of the great challenges, and I've been a pastor for many, many years, but one of the great challenges is always in the area of unity. Now, I have been blessed to never have been in, uh, in a church split. So I consider myself blessed that way because I know a lot of pastors that have had to go through church splits. There's nothing worse than having a church split. And so one of the greatest challenges uh, for churches is unity. And there's a reason for that, because we are all so different. We are all so different, right? I mean, we have different tastes, we, you know, I mean, it, on and on it goes. Our church, Evangel here, uh, we just went through a, a major transition. We got a new lead pastor. And any time that happens, there's always people who disagree. Getting 100% vote for pastors is really rare. It's rare. I'm not going to ask pastors here how many times they've got 100% vote. But I know it is rare. 
uh, because we all have different opinions, and so our vote is slanted towards a certain way. I've always been amazed, you know, I go to district conference pretty well every year, and um, when it comes to the elections at district conference, you know, we elect our, our DLT, we elect our, our officers, and so uh, I'm, always, I'm always interested with these elections, and, you know, it, it's rare again to have a 100% vote. And so I'm thinking, okay, we have all prayed. You know, we always pray before the elections. So we've all prayed. We are all lovers and followers of Jesus. We're all filled with the Spirit, right? You can't be a Pentecostal pastor unless you are. And so we all should be on the same page. So when there is a vote, and I, hear, and I see the results of the vote, I'm thinking, how did 10, 20, or 30% of the people miss it? Have you ever wondered that? Is it just me that thinks that way? How did that many people miss it? You know, were they not hearing from the Lord? Now, in this church setting, maybe it's a little bit different, but, you know, I'm thinking at district conference, these are mostly pastors. How is it that we're not all on the same page? Well, because we see things differently and, and we can interpret things differently. But at the end of the day, as followers of Jesus, we must stand firm in one spirit. I've got to tell you, over the years of district conference, I have not always voted for the person that got elected. But I've always wanted to be submissive to the new leader or whatever that might be. And I think that's important. And so I would say the same thing with Evangel, you know. Whether or not you voted for Mike at this point is really immaterial. The important thing is that we now unite behind the leader, right? Yeah. Unity. Because it's so easy for the vision to come in. And so, you know, having unity doesn't always mean we always agree with one another. Having unity is about being committed to one another in love. It is saying, maybe I'm not crazy about the decision that was made, but I am committed to unity and to loving you. That's how a good marriage works, by the way. My wife and I don't always agree. I mean, we got a little disagreement now going on, you know. <laughs> it's not serious. It's just, I like the natural color of my oak cupboards. And, and she wants to modernize them, you know, with painting them. So please pray for us, okay? <laughs> I don't think it's going to stare us apart, but <laughs> it, it is there, you know. So pray for my wife that she sees the light. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, so unity has to be worked at, right? There, there's got to be some compromise, you know, and maybe the covers will be painted white one day. I don't know. You know? I'm not going to divorce her if that happens. I'm still going to love her, right? We're still going to have unity. We're still going to sleep in the same bed. I mean, it, it's not going to change because we choose to walk together and through the good times and the bad times. We've been married, as you know, for over 50 years. And during that 50 years, there have been some challenges. <laughs> Somehow I don't like that laugh. <laughs> there have been some challenges with me, but she has persevered. <laughs> She's gone gray and I've lost my hair, but we're doing okay, okay. <laughs> you know, as believers, we must always be determined to stand in one spirit. Because I've been in the church long enough to know it's not always easy. It's not always easy because there, there, we have these disagreements at times and, 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 you know, and sometimes change is not easy. But in the end, you know, God's people, we, we come back to unity because we are. There was only one God. <laughs> We know we sang that, right? Bind us together, Lord. So as believers, we must be determined. And I want to use that word. We must be determined to stand together in one spirit. Divisions and splits are not the work of God's spirit. Not the work of God's spirit. Jesus calls us actually in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, or, or Paul speaks about that in Ephesians chapter 4, to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You remember that verse. Because it takes effort. 
It takes effort. You know, sometimes you get people in the church that's really hard to be in unity with. Have you noticed that? I know it's none of you here, but <laughs> there are times that in my pastoral ministry, I had to work really strong. In fact, one place, you know, well, I won't go into that story. <laughs> so fight for unity. Keep the unity. And then the third thing he says, contend for the faith. Paul understood that that the price that was paid for the gospel was a tremendous price. I mean, Jesus spilt his precious blood, all the suffering that he went through. I mean, it's, you know, for 2,000 years, people have tried to destroy and wipe out our faith. But God, over those 2,000 years, we, have made, become, we are stronger. You know, there are more Christians alive today than ever any other point in history. More Christians alive. In fact, when they try to bring uh, persecution, the churches tend to flourish. The stronger the persecution, the stronger the church gets. It's amazing. But contend for the faith. Uh, Paul, you know, was a contender of the faith. And at times, you know, he was willing to lay down his life. Because we have an enemy, and Satan will try to do whatever he can to stop the spread and the flow of the gospel. So Paul encourages the church in verse 29 here of our text that we've been granted the privilege not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. And you know, we living in North America, we don't really suffer too much, do we? I mean, we really have it pretty good. I'm not saying we don't have any you know, challenges, but we, you know, compared to the suffering church in the other parts of the world, we really are doing quite well. Uh, you know, when was the last time we have suffered for him? You know, our early church fathers, I mean, they didn't back down from confrontation. They stood their ground and they suffered, and some of them suffered horrible death. You know, when I read the story of Stephen there in Acts, you know, I mean, <laughs> here he is, you know, being stoned, and while in the midst of stoning, he's praying for his, the people that are stoning him and, and asking God to forgive them. I mean, tremendous, tremendous. Remember in the uh, story in Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 40, it says that his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And I like what happens here. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, what? Grumbling to the Lord, why are we suffering so much? The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Wow. Isn't that unbelievable? They're flogged, and of course, their flogging is, is, it was a horrible, horrible beating. But after they were flogged and told not to preach in the name of Jesus, they went out rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple course and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and preaching, uh, proclaiming the good news of Jesus is the Christ. Wow. They contended for the faith. And, you know, when I read about how they gave so much to contend for the faith, I can't drop the ball on my, on my, in my time. I must contend for the faith too. And, you know, right now, we have it fairly easy, but you know, it could change in Canada. Our freedoms, you know, could quickly change about, you know, I mean, couple this, during this COVID, we had some of our pastors that went to jail. And I'm not gonna get into the politics of that, but you know, we're living in times right now where maybe uh, it won't be, we won't have the freedom we enjoy. Maybe there will be some things that will take place. Are we willing still to contend for the gospel? It's not always easy serving Jesus. You know, even in Canada, you could be at work, uh, have a, you know, a, a, a job. Uh, I know a lot of you are retired, but maybe you had a job where you had persecution on the job. I know that, um, you know, even pastoring at churches, sometimes you face some persecution. Uh, it's like a salmon. It's not easy for a salmon to go upstream. You know, when you're, you and I, we, we live in a world today that's very ungodly, and it's like we're fighting against an ungodly world, and we're going up against a stream that is against us, and it's, it's tougher today, I think, to serve Jesus than ever before. That's my opinion. I think it's harder today to serve Jesus. 
I mean, we, we, have, we have such an ungodly society that we live in. And so it's not easy. But who said it was going to be easy? <laughs> Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Thank you for that promise. In this world, we will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So serving Jesus is not always an easy walk in the park. At work, you might be unpopular, even with your family. I know when I pastored you know, some of the um, uh, indigenous people and some of those bands, they faced a lot of persecution. I mean, uh, I remember one of the first places we were on, it was called the Silquati on Port Hardy, one of the reserves there. And uh, this alcoholic couple got saved in our church. Uh, and they just had a life transformation. I mean, they were just known as alcoholics in the community and they got gloriously saved. And uh, so they were coming to church. We had a bus, we were picking them up and I'd go by that reserve, pick them up. And you know, every week they'd come to church on Sunday. And then one Sunday they stopped coming. And I thought, oh, what happened to them? Because they're always coming every Sunday. So I decided to go and visit them during that week. And here their you know, windows were busted. Somebody had busted into their house got them down on the floor, poured alcohol in, on his, in his mouth to get him to go back to drinking. That's a true story. I thought, wow, persecution. So hard. We are blessed. But we, can we stand, make a firm stand for the gospel? I think we could, right? We could stand for the gospel. So Paul talks about that. And then in the second chapter, he goes into other areas. He says to be like-minded. I was talking about unity, you know, and um, we have reasons for unity. Uh, we are united in Christ. <laughs> you know, we sang that song tonight, one, one body. Uh, we all have the same spirit, and we all have the same experience of grace. Aren't we, you know, we all come in the same door. There's only one door. Jesus says, I am the way, you know, the truth and the life. So we all come in the same door. We're all sinners in this room, saved by grace, right? Let's try that again. <laughs> We're all sinners in this room, saved by grace. Yeah. So we can't judge one another. We can't pick at one another because we all come in the same doorway. We all need the same amount of grace. You know, I grew up in a pastor's home. And it's easy for me to look at myself as pretty, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I never smoked, never chewed, never went with those who did, you know. <laughs> I didn't do any of that stuff. You know, I lived a pretty decent life. But I, I keep reminding myself, it took the same amount of blood to save me as it did the worst of sinners. So I, don't, I can't put errors on myself. I can't elevate myself and say, well, you know, I'm really good. It, you know, Jesus didn't really die for me because I was so good. No, the same suffering he had to suffer for me, even though I had a life that was maybe fairly clean, it still took his dying, his shed blood for me to be saved. So all of us come the same way. We come through the doorway of grace. By grace, you are saved through faith not of yourself, gift of God. Wow. So these are some powerful things that unite us. To divide over the color of the sanctuary, and I've seen people get their nose in the air because of the, they didn't get the right color. You know, when we were painting our church in Dawson Creek, oh, Jesus, save us from doing that again. <laughs> when we were painting our church in Dawson Creek, you know, I made the mistake. I, I, you know, coming in the entranceway, I put some colors down, asking people, you know, and I kind of I kind of thought, you know, my simple thinking, that everybody would probably pick the same color. <laughs> there was probably five different choices, and we had an equal amount of people on each choice. Okay, you know, we're gonna have division over painting of the church. Oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? And I, I really didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, okay, we were going to recarpet the church, going to get new chairs, and we want it all to match. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And so I, I don't know, it was my wife or the Lord <laughs> that said, let's, let's get a consultant outside of the church. So we hired a lady that was a coordinator, you know, whatever they call those, interior decorator or something. And she came in. And she said, you need to go with this and this and this. 
And the next Sunday, I said to the people, we're going with this and this and this. Uh, a lady that knows what she's talking about. <laughs> if you don't like it, you blame her. <laughs> we had unity. We still had unity. So, you know, we sometimes have to work around those things, right? Because we are different. We have difference of opinion. Wow. And so Paul tells the church at Philippi, you know, that you could make my joy complete by three things. A, be light-minded, which is a challenge. B, have the same love. And C, be in one spirit and purpose. You think we could do that? How many think we could do that? Can we be like-minded? Can we have the same love? Can we be one in spirit and purpose? I think we can be. We can be. If you've got lots of kids, and uh, I was talking to, um, to Kirk Middlestad, we went and visited him, and they have eight children. And, you know, but when I pastored in Dawson Creek, we had, we had uh, uh, some families there that had 16 16 kids. <laughs> and some of those from Newfoundland have some big families, right? Some big families. And uh, we have three sons. So whether you got two kids or a dozen kids, it's your desire to see them loving one another, caring for one another. I mean, it's nothing, it, there's, there's nothing worse. I'm, a number of years ago, Lynn and I, our three sons, there, there was something that was going on with one of them, and so they weren't talking to one another. And here they were all pastors, too. But they, there was something that came up. And so Linda and I just made it a matter of prayer. And we just started to pray into it. And we pray, God, God, you got to work. You know what's going on. And God, you need got to work. And i got to tell you, God brought the walls down. Amen. And today they just love one another. They love to get together. And, and, so, and so if there's disunity in your home, that's your secret weapon is prayer. <laughs> Not interfering, prayer. Prayer can break down the walls. Prayer can do amazing things. And so a pastor, you know, as a, as a mom and dad love to have unity in their home, God wants unity in his family too. And so I've got to make every effort to make sure there is unity. And then my last point, number five, is care deeply of others. So the Christian life is all about Jesus. <laughs> it's pretty simple, isn't it? It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And, you know, again, in the next week, we're going to be talking about uh, Paul uses Jesus as an example, a great example. And he, in verse 7, he writes of Jesus that he made himself nothing. So the Christian life is not about me. It's about Jesus and others. And I, I said one of the things that we see a lot in Philippians is this word joy. And you've seen this acrostic before. Joy is simply Jesus first, others second, yourself last. If you want to have joy, put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. It really does work. It will work. Put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. And so in verse 3 and 4, there are some things here that, that Paul points out to us. And again, letter A, he says, do, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Wow, what a great word. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. And, and letter B there, consider others better than yourself. Just imagine what the church would be like if we could all do this. And then C, look out for the interest of others. This is great stuff, isn't it? This is great stuff. Man, this is where the rubber meets the road. If Christians in the church, if we could just live this way every day, that we do nothing out of selfish ambition, because it's not about me, it's about him. It's about Jesus. Consider others better than yourself. Look out for the interests of others. If the church could do that, we would be a different church. And I'm not just speaking about evangel, I'm speaking about the church at large. If the church could do that, we would be a different church. Because there's so many times people, it's about me. It shouldn't be about me, it's about Jesus, about others. Ourselves, laughs. Let me close by saying that there are many in this church who I see putting these things into practice. And I gotta tell you, Lynn and I just love 
being at Evangel, we just love to see the heart of so many people in this church. Uh, see how your servant heart works. I mean, it's amazing. We are amazing. And I just want to say, let's keep doing that. <laughs> let's keep being the church. Let's keep making it about Jesus, not about us, but let's keep making it about Jesus. Because we want his name to be lifted up. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So it's, you and I have a responsibility. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. And uh, so over the years, you have given of your time, your energy, your finances. The happiest Christians that I know are the ones who practice these teachings of Paul's. When we put these things into practice, wow. So again, we go back to our theme, live worthy lives. <laughs> let me be worthy, Lord. Let me be worthy. And that should be our prayer every day. Lord, let me be worthy. Let me be worthy. So Father, thank you for this word today. Thank you for these wonderful, Lord, uh, seniors and young people that are here tonight. We just thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege of living our lives for you, of serving you. And Lord, we know that it's not about me, it's about you. It's for your honor, it's for your glory. Lord, even as we pray for people to be healed, it's not to give us a name, but it's to lift up the name of Jesus. It's for your glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for touching Bob's daughter, Lord. That's to your glory, not to our glory. It's to your praise, not to our praise. It's not because of us, it's because of you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. So, Lord, I just pray that you'd help each one of us each day that we could live a life worthy of the calling that we have received, of the grace that's been handed down to us, Oh, God, we are so blessed. And, uh, and so I, I just pray a blessing over every one of us here tonight, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk and live in unity. Lord, not just in a church, but, Lord, with our spouses, with our family, Lord. Lord, you said as much as it lies within us that we're to, we're to live at peace with everyone. So, Lord, help us always to make that effort and to, um, Lord, to have unity, Lord, in our families, in our churches, in our neighborhood. Lord, help us to have unity uh, in our, in, uh, amongst one another, I pray. So bless these people, Lord. Bless the remainder of our service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take it away, Dan. We are one in the power of love. We are one in the power Don't you love unity? Amen. Have you ever seen a baseball team win or a hockey team win when there's not unity on the team? No. But when they're all working together, wow, they're strong. Let's work together, right, for the kingdom. Amen. Let's work together. God bless you. Good to have you all out tonight. Be safe as you drive home or walk home. And we'll see you next week.